praises of our God forever and ever. Amen. And to give another shout of praise to our Heavenly Father. Well, welcome everyone. Great to have you here. My name is Omar, and I have the honor and privilege of serving as the lead pastor here at CF. And I want to welcome everyone right now watching us at our local campuses online. But especially, I want to welcome our fathers. And so can we give it up for our fathers today? Hey, whether you are a dad, a grandfather, a father figure, listen, I hope that you are having a wonderful weekend, that God blesses you with the wisdom that you need in order to lead your family. And I also want to uh, wish a happy Father's Day to my dad, who currently lives on the other side of the world in this little island called Cyprus in the middle of the Mediterranean. But dad, if you're watching, happy Father's Day. We love you all the way down here from Miami. Well, today is not only a special weekend, because it's Father's Day, but also because we're starting a brand new series called Living the Good Life. It's our summer series, and we're going to be looking at components of how to truly live the good life that the Lord is offering us. And so I am excited and ready to dive into God's Word. I hope you are too. And so wherever you find yourself, open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 9, verse 2 and 3. You can follow along with me as I read. Listen to what God's Word says. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up to a high mountain by themselves, and he was what? Transfigured before them. And then listen to what it says in John chapter 10. Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it what? Have it what? Yeah, have it abundantly. In other words, Jesus came to this earth. He became a man. He revealed himself to us in order that we can live the good life that he is offering us, all right? Well, that is God's word. You can go and take a seat, everybody. You know, every single week, my wife and I try to have a date night, and before we had Camila, uh, you know, we had a lot of flexibility in our schedule, so every Friday night, we used to go out and go to a restaurant and just have a good time and just enjoy each other's company. But once I became a dad, when we had Camila, you know how it is, the flexibility goes out the window. And so, yes, we still go out and we still go to a restaurant here and there, but for the most part, our date nights are at home. And so, and so here's what we do uh, every Friday night. At 8 o'clock, once we put uh, uh, Camila to bed, I get in my car and I go to our, fav- to our favorite pizza place and I order our burrata, burrata pizza and with some prosciutto and some arugula, I get our favorite pizza. Then I drive all the way to our favorite ice cream shop and get us a pint of Nutella ice cream. And I come back and then we sit in front of the TV and we just catch up on all the shows that we could not watch throughout the week. And one of the shows that we always watch every Friday night is the show. It's My Lottery Dream Home. In fact, how many of you have ever seen that that show? Yeah, wow, more than I thought. There we go. Yeah, and so so if you have not seen it, let me just give you a quick overview of what takes place in every episode. Because in in every episode, you know, the, the, the story always centers around a family who's not living the good life. In fact, oftentimes they're struggling financially, they're struggling with something in their home, there's something with their family, and so they're not living the good life, but they're living the bad life, so to speak. But once they play the lottery, right, and they get this huge windfall of money, now they are in pursuit of that good life. And so here's what they do. They call David Bromstead, right, he's the host, and David helps them find that dream home where they can finally live the good life. In fact, take a look.
it's only $5 million, right? It's no big deal. But, but, but here's what happens. When, when people watch that show, and maybe right now as you are watching that, there's something in you says, wow, they're going to live that good life, right? They're going to be able to buy that home, that dream home. They're going to be able to buy all the cars. They're going to be able to go to that specific place on that beautiful vacation. I, they're going to be able to buy the clothes, the purse, whatever they want. They are finally going to live the good life. And so that's what many people, when they view that show, when they watch that show, that's, that's the impression that they get. Folks, here's the interesting part. Studies show that lottery winners are more likely to file bankruptcy within the first three to five years than the average American. And not only that, but studies also show that people who receive all these big windfall of money and are pursuing that, that, that dream life, right, that good life, oftentimes, listen, they're not happier or healthier than the average American. Oftentimes, they're less happy and less healthy than the average American. And folks, you know how it is sometimes. Because even in your own life, when you go out and you splurge on that vacation or that car or that clothing piece or whatever the case may be, you know, after you pursue that one thing, it's all right. It's nice. But that's about it. Somewhere along the line, as you're pursuing those things, they're all right, but they just kind of fall short. And folks, here's why, and don't miss it is because the good life that the world offers us always overpromises and underdelivers, doesn't it? They overpromise all this pleasure, all these excitement, but oftentimes they underdeliver. And family, let me just bring all that over to our time together because what a contrast to the life that the Lord offers you and me, amen? And by that I mean that just like, listen, the good life that the world offers us often just falls short. Listen, unlike that, and here's the big idea as we dive into God's Word, the good life that Jesus offers us, listen, always exceeds our wildest expectations. And we get to experience things in our life with the Lord that we would have never thought. We, would, we experience this deep inner peace. We get to experience this joy that is from the Lord that only the Lord gives us. It gives us the ability to taste what it means to know that we're forgiven of our sins and that we are right with God. You see, a life, the life that Jesus offers us always far exceeds everything that we could ever imagine. And who knows, maybe you're right now you're thinking, you're sitting here at one of our campuses, you're watching on, online, and you're thinking, well, Omar, listen, I, I'm, I'm tracking with you and I know that the life that God has for me is, is great. But if I could be honest, you know, I come to church often, I watch the service, I, you know, I do whatever I can, but I don't feel like I'm experiencing that good life. You know, I'm, I'm living a good, normal life, you know, but, but, but that really great, abundant, amazing life with the Lord, I just, I just don't know if I'm experiencing that. So how can I do that? How, how can I experience this life? Well, we're going to find out, not only from Mark chapter 9, but also throughout this series, all right? So if you have your Bible, turn to Mark chapter 9, and you can uh, fire up your Christ Fellowship apps as well. You can download them in the, in the app store. And today, listen, I have two thoughts on how you can live the good life that Jesus offers us. So write this down as point number one. First of all, in order, in order to live that good life, listen, you must have a clear view of who Jesus is. In fact, let's go to the passage for today and listen to what it says. It says, now, and after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was what? transfigured before them all. Now, pause right there for a moment. Let me set up the scene for us. Because as we start winding down the Gospel of Mark and start making our way towards the cross, the passage for today is of utmost importance. Because at this point, right before this, Peter had confessed 
that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, is the Christ of God. And right after he does that, Jesus tells them, listen, after this, I'm going to have to suffer many things. I will be crucified, and then I'm going to resurrect to new life. And church, when the disciples heard this, especially Peter, when he heard this, it was hard for him to process all of this because they did not see, it did not fit with the good life that they thought Jesus was offering them. And so suffering was coming not only for Christ, but suffering was also coming for them as well. And so in order to prepare the disciples for the suffering ahead, listen, he does something very rare. In fact, it's the only time that we see this in the New Testament. And here's what he does. He takes their faith, listen carefully, to sight. He, for the, the only time where he takes his faith, their faith, to sight, and for the first time, he reveals himself to the disciples for who he really is. And the way he does that is by changing his appearance. Now, if you have your Bibles with you, have your Bibles open or your app, just circle the word transfigured for just a moment. Because the word transfigured in the original Greek text, you know, here at CF, we always like to remind you that the Bible was first written in Greek and Hebrew and then translated to different languages. Well, the word here in the original text is a compound Greek word, and the word is metamorpho. Now, the first part of that word is meta, which means to change. And then the word morpho means the outer form, the, the, the figure, the, the, what, what you can see of a thing. In fact, this is where we get the word metamorphosis from. You can see the similarity there. And so what, what, what really Mark here is showing us as he's writing this is that the Lord at this juncture, he literally changes his appearance, like everything about him changes. In fact, the Gospel of John says that as he's praying, at that moment, as he's praying, his whole body just transforms into something else. And folks, here is what he does by allowing his body to transform. He, he does this for two specific reasons. First of all, write this down as letter A. First of all, through this, Jesus reveals his eternal glory. Now, listen to what the text says. It says, and, and his clothes became what? Radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And then in Matthew, another account, right, that, that, that talks about the transfiguration, Matthew says, and he was transfigured before them, metamorpho, before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And, and so notice, what we see here is that at that moment, as he's praying, the Lord transforms, his outer appearance transforms, and his face, it's almost like if you were looking at the sun. Have you ever tried to look at the sun? You can't even look at it. You have to look to the side a little bit. But it's, it's that brilliance that's coming from the Lord. Now, you have to remember, these are Jewish men who knew the Old Testament really, really well. In fact, they grew up hearing all the stories from the Old Testament. And they knew that in the Old Testament, whenever God revealed himself, one of the ways that he revealed himself was through radiant light, which is the same description here. In fact, Scripture calls that at times the Shekinah glory of God. And so when the disciples saw this radiant glory and his face shining like the sun, listen, they knew that this was not an ordinary Messiah. This was not an ordinary man. This had to be God from the Old Testament, the eternal God. And so in order to confirm that he is the eternal God, listen to what it says next in, in verse 4. Listen to what it says. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses. And they were talking with Jesus, and Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, which means teacher, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, for he didn't know what to say, for they were terrified. 
And so listen, you gotta love Peter, right? Because he's at a moment, he doesn't know what to say. He's literally terrified. And he said, okay, Lord, I, let me just make you three tents and you guys could camp out here and we can settle down. But the truth of the matter is that he didn't even know what to say because he was such in shock of what he was seeing. But you see, the appearance of Elijah and Moses was really important. You see, Elijah represented all the Old Testament prophets who spoke about Jesus, and then Moses represented the old law, the Old Testament law, which what? Foreshadowed Jesus. And so, and, and so the Father allows Elijah and Moses to be next to Jesus to show and to affirm that Jesus is the one that God had promised and that humanity was waiting for. And folks, here's why it's important that these men had a clear view of who Jesus was. Because just years down the line, Peter who was watching this would one day be crucified upside down. And family, as he's being crucified upside down, he needed to know exactly who he was dying for. You know, James, who was there watching this, he was beheaded early on in the history of the church. And family, as that sword or that guillotine came down on him, listen, he needed to have a clear view of who Jesus was. John, who we all know towards the end of his life, was dipped in hot oil. And folks, as he is being dipped in hot oil and he smells his flesh burning, listen, folks, he needed to know exactly what type of savior Jesus was. And family, listen, just like them having a clear view of Jesus was important for these three men, can I tell you, for us today, it's just as important. Because chances are that we're all going through something in our life, aren't we? You know, truth of the matter is that sometimes when we come to church on the weekend, we put our Sunday face on. We walk into church and like everything's okay and things are all right, but the reality is that many of us here today, listen, we're going through difficult moments. Some of us are having marriage issues, family issues, financial issues, health issues. We have all these things going on, and the reality is that the way that we endure in trusting Christ during these hard moments in life is by having a clear view of who Jesus is. That he is just not an ordinary man, but he is the king of the universe, the sovereign God, the creator of all things. Amen, family? And so listen, as we go through, yeah, we can clap for that. Because listen, as you and I go through hard times and moments, listen, if we don't have a clear view of who the Lord is, of who it is that we're trusting, listen, our faith will falter, doesn't it? And so that clear view you have of the Lord, the stronger your faith will be during the hard moments in life. But then not only does that, that, does that transfiguration reveal the eternal glory of God, Jesus is also doing something in the process that maybe we don't even realize as well. In fact, write this down as letter B. Through the transfiguration, Jesus also reveals our future glory, our future glory. In fact, listen to what it says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. It says this. It says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies, right, our lowly broken bodies, to be like his what? His glorious body. So lowly body to glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. In fact, church family, if you were here last week, we talked about the second coming of Christ. And so what we are learning is that once Christ returns and that trumpet is sound, listen, the people who put their faith in Christ and have already passed away, the Lord shows us that their dead body will resurrect and their body will be now a glorious body, just like the Lord. And for us, listen, that we are here still trusting in him and we see him come back. Folks, our bodies will be transforming into the same type of body that the disciples saw in Jesus at the transfiguration. This is why Jesus said that the righteous, 
will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. The same description that he uses to describe what they saw Jesus. And so what Peter, James, and John were seeing is not only the glory of Christ, his glorified body, but they're also seeing the glory that awaited them. You know, it's interesting that John, who was there, later on towards the end of his life, listen to what he writes to us. He says this. He says, Beloved, we are God's children now. Listen, right now, we are the, for those of us who put our faith in Christ, we are the children of God. Right now, you've been adopted by your heavenly Father. But notice, and what we will be, notice, what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, in other words, when he, we see him at his second coming, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. See, because on the day that the Lord returns and we set our eyes on Christ, at that moment, by the power that enables all things to, to bring to himself, he will transform our bodies from our lowly bodies to our new glorified bodies. And folks, listen, when I realize this, that our bodies will be transformed, and at that moment, listen, there will be no more illnesses, there will be no more aches, there will be no more cancer, there will be no more heart issues, there will be no more disabilities, and from that moment on, listen, for all of eternity, we will have a body, a glorified body that Christ is preparing for us. And church, you know, you know when this became a reality for me? Because I know sometimes we hear this and it's conceptual, but here's when I realized the power of this verse in my own life. And that is when I think of someone like Roque Cespedes. Listen, Roque, he is man, an awesome, amazing man of God right here. He has, start, he has been with Christ Fellowship since the beginning. When I started the Miami Springs campus, he was started coming to our church, and he's still in the route. He still goes every single weekend. And uh, as you can see, uh, he has um, cerebral palsy, which doesn't allow him to speak, you know, easily or movements as his mom, Marisol, such a faithful woman of God every Sunday. If you go to the Doral campus, they're there, man, they are a blessing. But let me tell you something about Roque, because this is a man who loves the Lord. This man loves the Lord. And not only that, but listen, he knows more about God's Word than most people. In fact, I used to lead a young adults uh, group back in the day when I was at that campus. And, you know, the way we used to do it, we used to get in a circle. We used to have 40, 50 people. And we used to have a great Bible study. And Roque has a, t a gift of teaching, actually, because he knows so much. So here's, but it's hard for him to communicate. So here's what he did. I told him, listen, Roque, let's do this, man. You type out, the, or write out the teaching, and then I'll share it for you. So he literally went, little by little, he wrote out an entire teaching. And so he sat right next to me in front of everybody, and I read his teaching. And as people were fielding questions, I was asking him, I was answering for him. And folks, they love that teaching more than any other teaching that I ever did. But, but folks, here's what I realized going, you know, talking about this. Sometimes I wish, man, I wish I could just talk to Roque freely. I wish I could just walk around and just at the campus and just do certain things with them. But you know the reality? Is when I started thinking about this verse, there's going to be a day where that body will be transformed. And in the new kingdom, listen, I will be walking with Roque. We'll be talking about the things of God. We'll be dreaming about things we had never dreamed about. And we will be just doing things we could never do before. And, and sometimes, here's what happens, listen, family, in our own daily lives, if you have someone in your life that maybe has an illness, a, a chronic illness, cancer, maybe a disability, maybe right now, maybe you have an elderly parent, a grandparent that you're looking and you're going through a hard time, listen carefully. Sometimes we get so focused on this world and we forget this is a short little while. That there is an eternity waiting for us where we will all have glorified bodies and the effects of our sinful nature will no longer have dominion for us. Can I get an amen to that family? And folks, what a glorious day will be. So listen, if you're in this situation, have hope. It's a short while and then we'll be with Christ. But folks, going back to the transfiguration, 
Listen, Jesus didn't reveal himself for just no reason, but there should be an effect in our life. In fact, write this down as big number two. Clearly seeing Jesus should clearly change us. Should clearly change us. In fact, listen to what it says in God's word. It says, and we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord, seeing the glory of the Lord, are being what? Transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. In other words, if you have truly seen Christ for who he is, and you have put your faith in Christ, as in family, there should be a clear, decisive change in your life. And so you got to ask yourself, after you started coming to church and you started following the Lord, has there been a clear, decisive change in your life? When your old buddies from high school or college, when they see your life, do they see a clear change? Do your friends from work who've known you for years and years, do, have they seen a change in your life? Your family, the way that you carry yourself, the way that you speak, the way you react, the way that you forgive other people, is, has there been a clear change in your life? Because so many people say, hey, I've had a change. I've put my faith in Christ, but you know what? Their life doesn't reflect it. And everyone sees it. Everyone around sees that their life has not changed. And so, folks, listen, once you truly have had, seen Christ, have you trusted Christ, here is what first happens. Write this down as letter A. We begin to listen to Jesus. In fact, let's go back to the text of the transfiguration. Listen to what happens. Very interesting. It says this. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them, but Jesus only. Can we go to the next text? Let me read it to you. <laughs> All right, it says, And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved Son. And then it says what? Listen to him. Listen to him. And then uh, suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And family, listen, here's what we're saying. What we're learning here is very simple, and that is that when God the Father reveals the Son to you, listen, He expects you to listen. Now, there's a difference between hearing and listening, isn't there? Hearing is when we hear audible sound, but listening is when you are attentive and thinking through the information and processing the information being given. See, the truth of the matter is that right now at all of our campuses and online, everyone is hearing God's word, but not everyone's listening. Let me repeat that. Everyone right now is hearing my voice, but not everyone is listening to God's word. Because when you listen, you are carefully attentive to what is being said, and you are processing and you're thinking through everything being communicated. And you know what happens when you listen carefully, when you are really, really processing God's word and the truth is being communicated, here's what happens. You begin now to meditate on God's word. In fact, listen to what the Lord told Joshua before he entered into the promised land. He said this. He said, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall what? A little louder. You can meditate on it day and night. So, so part of listening to God's word carefully is that in turn you start meditating on God's truth. It's almost, you know, listening to God's word and meditating, it's almost, it's almost like, like a cow when it eats. Let me show you what I mean by that. 
You know, we've all seen, you know, cows and they're, right, lovely creatures and all, but we've always seen, you know, we've seen them and they love to eat grass, right? They're, you've seen them in, whether in person or at a farm or a video, you've seen them just eating the clumps of grass. And they eat a lot. And so here's what happens. When they're eating, you would think that they're digesting it, but they're not. You see, when they're eating, they're actually storing all that food into a place called the rumen inside of their stomach. And this rumen is a 55-gallon size container inside of their stomach. And they're storing all that food in there. So here's what they do. Then afterwards, they go and they lay down. And then they start. And you just, if you look at them, they start just, they just, they're just chewing when they're laying down. And here's why. It's because at that moment, they are unswallowing what they ate before. They're chewing it, chewing it, chewing it, swallowing it again. Unswallow it again later on, chew it some more, chew it some more, and then eventually later on, after processing it, then they're able to digest it. And folks, what an image of what we should be doing with God's Word. Because when we listen to God's Word, it's not just meant for us to hear and that's it. Listen, you, we are, part of listening is to meditate on God's Word, to think about it through the day. When you open God's Word in the morning, you think about it through the day. When you come to church on the weekend, you think it throughout, throughout the week. You're supposed to meditate and process and listen to God's Word. And here's what happens. Once you're doing that, write this down as letter B. Then we begin to obey Jesus. In fact, listen to what it says in Joshua chapter 1. It says this. It says, The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. And here's a key. So that you may be careful to do according to all that's written in it. In other words, the reason that we are to receive God's word and listen as we process and meditate on it is so that we would be careful to obey everything that the Lord commands us to. And unfortunately, many people listen. Right now you may be listening, but somewhere along the way there's a fault and they don't obey. And you know what happens when you listen and don't obey? You end up self-deceiving yourself. In fact, listen to the warning in the book of James. It says this. It says, do not merely, what? Listen. Don't merely listen and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. If anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says, it's like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. You know, listening to, in other words, just like it's odd for someone to go to the mirror, look at themselves in the mirror, all right, and then walk away and just forget how they look like, how odd is that? Folks, just like that. When someone listens to God's Word, but they don't obey, that's how odd that is. And you know, there's a reason, in my opinion, why so many people listen to God's Word, but don't obey. And here it is. It's because somewhere on the line, they have replaced, listen carefully here, they have replaced obedience with conviction. Think about this. They've replaced obeying God's word with being just convicted about God's word. And, and, and sometimes here's what happens. You know, I've heard so many people that they go to church service somewhere here or wherever, and they walk out and they're like, oh man, that was a good service. Oh, man, that hit me, that was powerful. You've heard that before, right? Oh, they walk out, oh man, good word, pastor. That was powerful. And what they're saying, man, that was, man, I was convicted about that. But then they get in their car, and then they never obey. Because somewhere on the line, they think, that the end goal of listening to God's Word is just feeling convicted about something. But they don't realize that the end goal is obedience. And so somewhere along the line, we love feeling convicted. Oh man, that hit me hard. That was a good word. But somewhere along the line that we don't obey. And so folks, if we need to be careful not to, for, not to let stop in conviction, but it move to obedience. Amen, church family? 
There has to be a moment, listen, where we understand that God's word and God's conviction is meant to lead us to obedience and following God's word. And folks, let me end with this. You know, the Lord said this in John chapter 10. He said, I came that they may have life and have it what? Abundantly. You know, I think we all want to experience that good life. I think we all want to experience that abundant life that the Lord offers us. But make no mistake about it. It all starts with obedience. In fact, listen to what God's Word says in James. He says this. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, right, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they would be what? They would be blessed in what they do. You know, the word blessed in the original Greek is the word makarios, and the word makarios simply means happy. So, so what is God's word saying? That those who hear God's word and continue obeying it, listen, they are able to finally experience the blessed, happy, good life that the Lord is offering us. And so family, as we start off this series, listen, it starts with obedience. You know, we, we can't get to a point when we become hypocritical, where we want, ex- we want to experience God's good life in certain areas in our lives, but without obedience. Listen, if, if, if you want to experience a good life that the Lord is offering you, you got to start walking in obedience. Because once you start walking in obedience in your life, then you will be able to truly experience the good life that the good Lord has for you. And so today on this Father's Day, what, what is this? What is that area in your life that you want the good life that God has to offer you, but you're not obeying Him? Is it in your marriage? When things get tough, you don't obey? Is it in your romantic life, in your dating life, in your sexual life? Is it at work? Is it with your children? What is it? Listen, there's many reasons. You know, you know the area that you know you're not obeying the Lord and therefore you're not experiencing the good life. And so my challenge to us today, especially fathers, on this Father's Day weekend, listen, fathers, God has entrusted you so much to lead your families. God has given you so much responsibility. Listen, if you want the good life for you and your family, you need to be the man of God that obeys God's word. You may not be perfect, and that's fine, but you need to strive towards obedience because when you obey, listen, your whole family will be blessed because of it. Amen? And so listen, whoever you are, it doesn't matter whether you're a father or not, listen, the chance for us today to experience a good life, the first thing we got to do is what? It's obey. Listen and obey. But maybe you're here right now, you're thinking, oh, you know, Omar, the reality is that I've I've never even experienced anything like that because I don't even have a relationship with God. So you're wondering, Omar, how do I do that? How do I how do I start this life with God, experience everything that He has to offer me? Well, listen. It's not by coming to church. It's not tuning in right now. It's not doing a good deed. It's not um, doing a ritual when you were a little kid. It's very simple. One of the most famous verses in the Bible, John 3, 16, says this. For God so loved you that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have what? Everlasting life, abundant life, that good life that God has to offer you. See, the way that you start experiencing everything that God has for you today is by coming to a point that you surrender your life. You surrender your life. You put your faith and trust in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. And Scripture tells us that when you do that, listen, He forgives you of all of your sins. First of all, everything you've done you're ashamed of, He forgives you. He makes you His son and daughter, right? You start a personal relationship with the Lord. And then he starts leading you and guiding you, showing you the way to have the good life that he has for you. But you have to come to a point that you surrender, that you put your trust in Christ. The question is, though, will 
Would you put your trust in him? Would you finally surrender and start your journey with the Lord? Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we're grateful today, oh God, that you are a God who gives us, offers us a good life. And not only that, but Father, you lead us in the way we should go. So Father, my prayer for all of us is that we would obey you, oh Lord. Listen and obey so we can follow you, Lord. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, for those of us today who you're watching right now, you're saying, I want to know that life. I'm going to lead you through a prayer. Simple prayer is just me helping you talk to God. And so when you pray this prayer, quiet in your heart, you don't pray to me. You pray this to the guy who loves you. And so pray this from your heart. Lord, today I realize that the good life that this world offers me has led me nowhere. But today I realize that there's an alternative, the life that you offer me. And so I come before you, Lord. I confess all of my sin put my trust in you, Lord, and ask you, Lord, to give me everlasting life. And Lord, for the rest of my life, Lord, I may not be perfect, but help me to live the good life that you have in store for me. So Lord, thank you, O oh God, for saving me today. I in Jesus' name I pray. I love God's people say, amen. Hey, can we show some love to those of us who pray that prayer, whoever you may be? Because if that's you, I want to encourage you. If you're on one of our campuses on the way out, stop by our Next Step booth. We have a Bible for you. It will take a second, but you know what? It will help you get connected to us and one of our pastors will help you. Or online, go to cfmiami.org slash connect, and right there and there, you can fill out that card, and one of our pastors will reach out to you. Well, I'm going to call all campus pastors to the front. Christ Fellowship, I love you all. Happy Father's Day. Let's live that good life that the Lord has offered us. Amen? God bless you.